Hey guys, welcome to my show again. And today we have a very special guest on our show, and his name is Lucas Cantor. So he's from Los Angeles, and today we will have a hell of an intro again. So Lucas is a composer, producer, multi instrumentalist, and a speaker. He won two Emmys for Olympics 2008 and 2012. He also co-produced Lord's cover of Everyday Wants to Rule the World on the Hunger Games. He co-wrote the theme song for Major League Soccer. He also delivered a TEDx talk on the subject of artificial intelligence and creativity. He composed music for the Netflix anime Cannon Buster. Well, you know the list goes on, so I will put his website link in the description and make sure you check out his work so hi lucas good to have you here on my show it is great to be here thank you i was just adjusting my light i realized it's a little bit harsh and i'm a little bit shiny and you know we're from la so we pay attention to this stuff what are you gonna do you look great i don't know i don't know what you're doing over there but <laughs> yeah man thank you man so uh, let's go through our first question, actually. How artificial intelligence is changing the music industry? All right. So in the um, in 1889, um, a, a man by the name of, uh, I want to say Herman Hollerith, Franz Hollerith, I don't know, uh, approached the U.S. government with the idea of organizing the census on a series of punch cards and some machines that he had devised that would uh, be able to process information quickly. And he said that uh, what the US government was doing was like taking a fine quality picture, but then not ever developing it. And so that they had all this data, but they had no way of, um, they had no way of really analyzing it. And mm -hmm. so his solution was to put it all on punch cards so that they could get adding machines, which were just rudimentary computers at that time, to generate some metadata and, you know, draw some conclusions and show some uh, significant statistical uh, comparisons between, uh, you know, different things. So they did the census on punch cards in 1890 and uh, Hollerith's company did it again in, eight, uh, in 1900. Uh, but at that point, they were no longer called uh, whatever they were called, card punch -o -matic or something. Uh, they had changed to being called IBM. And right. that is the IBM corporation that we know today. So um, the idea of using data and using big data in order to draw conclusions about large um, populations of people or uh, large trends is very, very old, uh, at least 100 years old and probably even older than that. And the music business is doing that on a larger and more detailed scale than ever today with uh, streaming platforms and um, uh and streaming platforms and uh and music you know applications and uh, you know all music is sold almost all music is sold digitally today the vast majority of it especially in the u.s um or sold is a sort of a strong word for what it is today but it is distributed digitally distributed, anyway exactly. in the united states and what that comes along with is uh just granular level analysis of how long people listen what they listen to, what they listen to over and over and over again. And also there's a social function so you can see what your friends are listening to. And this data collection, while it started on punch cards uh, 120, 130 years ago now, has continued to this day and only evolved exponentially since then. And so one way that AI has changed the music business is it has uh, changed what the consumer hears mm -hmm. and uh, how they hear it and how often they hear it. And it's changed the way that the people who are selling it are able to interpret that data. So that's pretty significant, Yeah, I think. That's a good start, right? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, uh, I have also, you know, come up with a thing, you know, why music evokes, you know, this kind of emotions like amusement, joy, eroticism, beauty, relaxation, and even anxiety. So this is my question, you know. Well, uh, I, it means different things to different people. I think um, I'm, I'm not going to, I don't have the, I don't know who to attribute this quote to, but um, mm -hmm. it was said that uh, an explorer is someone who goes out into the world and then comes back and tells people of his travels. And an adventurer is someone who goes out into the world and doesn't come back or doesn't tell anyone about what they did. And uh, I think artists are by definition are necess necessarily explorers. Not only do we have to make the art, make the music, we also have to show it to people and share it with people. And part of what uh, is courageous about doing that is that everybody interprets art differently and everybody interprets music differently. And so mm -hmm. music has the power to move people. It's mm -hmm. it's a bit circular. Music has the power to move people because music has the power to move people. It's, 
It's not that anything inherent in the medium is emotional. Mm -hmm. It's that we have attached a lot of emotions to the medium itself. And a lot of the most important moments in our lives from graduations to weddings to funerals are accompanied by songs that mean different things to different people. And mm -hmm. you and I, Abhishek, are from different cultures. Exactly. And so you would have a different reaction to some of the music that I find very emotional. And I would have a different reaction to some of the music that you find very emotional. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll give you an example. There's a, a song that that I like, um, that I love called En Mi okay. Viejo San Juan, which is, you know, a uh, Mm -hmm. It's a, it's in Spanish. It's about Puerto Rico. It was written by Noel Estrada as he was leaving okay. the island. Um, and for Puerto Ricans, it's a very, very emotional song. Um, and I don't know if you are, you know, part Puerto Rican or if you know any Puerto Ricans, but if no, I played it yeah. for you, your reaction would probably be, it's a nice song, you know, it's yeah. a nice, but it won't have the same impact that it has for me. And that's because I have associations with that song that are different than the associations that you have, even though we would both be listening to the same music. So yeah so i think you know by you are saying what you are saying is like if you are connected with the music to the people you are, are you trying to say like if if you are surrounded with the puerto ricans around you and uh, mm -hmm. you you are listening to that music and you are connecting with them that's how you can create emotions uh, through them right or you are just saying if you know the language and you are trying to listen to it that's how you can do it I'm saying that the uh, motion in music comes from context and the narrative surrounding the music and not from the music itself Mm -hmm. All right, cool. So, all right, so there is another question which you know, uh, randomly I found on research while doing research uh, is, are musicians good at math? Okay. <laughs> I, I ask this question because mathematics play a vital role in music harmony, actually. So, mm -hmm. are musicians good at math generally? Uh, I, I can't comment on whether musicians are generally good at math. Uh, I think. <laughs> Well, there are yeah. some similar concepts that um, mm -hmm. what mathematicians do at the highest level is manipulate symbols in order to uh, find higher truths. And I think that mm -hmm. that is what musicians do as well. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit, it's, you know, that yeah. at, a, at a broad level, they're very similar. I think um, once you drill into the specifics, mm -hmm. they're, they're quite different. Mathematics, I think, is uh, a lot about describing phenomena in the physical world, which is mm -hmm. um, not something that music really deals with uh, directly anyway. Yeah, so uh, I think the, I was actually, you know, focusing on that pattern thing. So you, the mm -hmm. pattern we follow, or if you try to create a music, if you are trying to create a music, that same way, you know, math in maths also, we do some, you know, equations or some things that have a patterns and we end up uh, to a, you know, result. So that I was referring to actually. So I think, you know, can we still call it art if we create music by machines and algorithms? Yeah, it's art if people if people listen to it and like it. I mean, I don't, actually, I think it's art if people listen to it and don't like it. I think that it becomes, like I said, with the explorer versus the adventurer, what I was getting at there is that showing someone your art and presenting your art, I think, is what makes it art. And that, because until it can be judged, it's just something you did. And until someone else can react to it, it's not communicating anything. It's just your journal, you know? I mean, I have, I have a bunch of journals here that I write thoughts in. Is that okay. writing? Not really. It's me just organizing my thoughts. When I publish it, it becomes writing. Oh yeah, yeah exactly. Well, you know, there is. Um, well, I know symphonies are complicated, long form pieces. While there are other symphonies which are, you know, unfinished, including Beethoven's Symphony Number no. Ten, Mahler's Symphony Number no. Ten, and more. Mm -hmm. But why Schubert's unfinished symphony is the greatest classical composition? As I uh, heard of it, right. That it's the greatest classical composition? Yeah, wherever I look for it, I can find this term. Like, it is one of the greatest, uh, you know, cl classical compositions ever to be made, right? Well, to, to echo what I said before, I think it's just because of the story surrounding it. It's Schubert was a uh, very prolific composer. He finished symphonies after that symphony. Um, so he didn't he didn't die writing it. Uh -huh. um, he, he just gave up on it. And uh, the uh -huh. reason I think is that the symphony was a little bit ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. And it was, it had three, I won't get too specific, but it had three movements, two movements and a sketch for a third movement in triple meter, which was uncommon at the time. Mm -hmm. And I think he just didn't, I think he just painted himself into a corner and didn't know where to go. And he was famous for giving pieces up, but mm -hmm. because it acquired this narrative of Schubert's unfinished symphony, because he, he had written half of it. It's just kind of a great story. And it's a, it's a great idea. The building had been finished. Um, <laughs> 
Yeah. And so I think it again it's a it's a narrative and then the if the story can pull you into listening to that piece of music it also is a beautiful piece of music. Exactly. You know, I think he's, uh, he did some romantic he started with romantic symphony, right? And you know some lyrical melodies actually. So I thought it would be a good question to come up. Well, if you think about AWS deep composer or Iva uh, that mm-hmm. creates this music if you feed them with some uh, simple notes or what uh, but what struck me that there is no soul or emotions because it comes from human experience well so do you think should we draw the line if ai start realizing human conscience and make people make music like we do what what uh, draw the line what do you mean i mean see uh, if ai start making music like we do if they have that emotions or you know what i'm trying to say soul so mm-hmm. is it good for us or humans or the music yeah, who creates the music musicians right are are you asking me if we should shut down a computer if it develops a soul yeah <laughs> um, i i think i mean I, there's a star trek that's episode about thing. that i i don't <laughs> that's yeah. a bizarre thing actually so uh, that's my question because everywhere i was looking researching about it even in plenty of ge- comments around general people they are uh, they are actually asking this thing plenty of times so i thought Uh, I think you were the right person who can you know uh, put some light on it so that people may get some clear- clarity on it right Yeah um I don't know how you would know if a machine had a soul because people are making uh, you know uh, AI can create ML can machine learning are creating this uh, robots and this plenty of mm-hmm. you know things uh, algorithms and they are feeding them data by data uh, millions of data actually and these data are started to if they start to realize with using the deep learning concepts and they start mm-hmm. u- start realizing like uh, what is consciousness and what is this things so uh, i was you know people are worried about it and i was confused like uh, well, i'm, I'm trying to, i'm trying to it. i'm hmm. trying to help you come to the conclusion that i've come to is so hmm. how would you know if the machine developed a soul how would you know if it was conscious see uh, uh, if you start feeding them data and they start making this crazy things it's developing every year the things are getting you know hyped up and it's getting sure. developed right but but at what point i mean you know elephants are pretty smart you know yeah. so are dolphins so are uh, um cephalopods So mm-hmm. how how do we know where do we draw the line like wh- where's where how will we know that the machine has developed a soul I mean I I see what you're saying that mm-hmm. we're worried that it's getting more advanced and that they're getting to be mm-hmm. smarter and smarter and smarter mm-hmm. B- but to what end what is the what is the logical end of machines networking each other and sharing information in the way that they share information digitally what is the mm-hmm. you know wh- where's where is the point at which we will say this machine has developed a soul and how will we know and how will we prove it and how will we describe it maybe in some near future this may come somebody will build up a something some ai which can you know well okay uh, but crazy. what i'm what i'm trying to what i'm trying to get at is how do you know that i have a soul okay a soul yeah soul is you know uh, is parallelly i'm trying to say is emotions or something like that because a robot right but how do you how do you know that i have emotions You know that you have emotions and yeah. you assume from the way that I behave that I also have emotions but you have no a way living, of knowing if that's true. Thing, a living thing may have emotions mm-hmm. including animals. I don't know about mm-hmm. the plants actually mm-hmm. but I know that anim- uh, animals and we humans do have emotions uh, in a certain way. So uh, that uh, gives us this uh, amazing musical experience and uh, we can feel about it, right? So if robots start feeling about this music and they can create it as i've seen in amazon you know deep composer because it was crazy the bizarre like they have created some crazy you know uh, algorithm that can you know create uh, a music by its own if you just feed them with some chords or you know something like that so that was i'm trying to say that it will be stressed out in the future it will be crazy so uh, people need to know that uh, it won't be so harsh about it and there will be a bad well, there, i mean that, that's the uh, you know I'm, i i have two I, fundamental I, I disagreements with what you've said and okay. one of them is that uh it is not necess- it does not logically follow that because computers have been advancing and being able to make music in the at the rate that they have been that they will necessarily continue with that rate in the future there is i don't think that there's any evidence that there's a power law relationship between computing speed and musical capability. 
So it might be mm -hmm. that we've reached the limits of computer music already. It also might be that the limits, limits. of computer music are far beyond our comprehension and okay. it will go beyond anything that we can understand. Both of those things might be true and we don't know yet. Um, mm -hmm. And the other thing is that um, if a, how to know if a machine has a soul, which is what you were asking me before, is, an, is really so far has, has baffled philosophers for at least 5,000 years. And I don't know, I don't see an answer forthcoming because it's impossible to know really. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't know what a soul is. You'd have to, I mean, if you want to tell me that a machine has become conscious, you have to first define for me what consciousness is. And if you can do that, then you can go teach philosophy at Harvard. Um, <laughs> because nobody really knows the answer to that question. And there, there certainly are a lot of theories. And there is this um, sort of, you know, to echo the U.S. Supreme Court, you, you kind of know it when you see it. I mean, mm -hmm. I, or at least you assume you do. I mean, uh, again, you and I are not in person. You're in India and I'm in Los Angeles right now. Mm -hmm. And it is certainly possible that one or both of us are hologram simulations and okay. that neither of us have emotions and that this mm -hmm. entire exchange is fabricated. And neither you nor I, nor the viewer, nor the listener would know the difference if what we're saying is interesting to them. Um, mm -hmm. And that, uh, the, to, to bring up one more point about what you said, which is that if uh, if Amazon Deep Composer or if Ava writes a piece of music and you have an emotional reaction to it, does that prove that they have a soul? Well, not really, no. because like I said, like I could play for you and me Vieja San Juan, which would which would make my grandmother cry every time and gives me an emotional reaction. And you're not going to have mm -hmm. that same reaction to that piece of music because exactly. there's no narrative associated with it for you. Exactly. Yeah, uh, that's right, actually. So. I was trying to clarify these things because uh, I have seen this uh, several things out there in the internet and people are, you know, getting crazy. Small composers, actually, they are getting crazy about it. AI is coming and we need to, you know, uh, step up. This is not thing. I, I was confused, like why they are, you know, I'm a machine learning student myself, actually. So I I don't I'm, I'm not worried about these things because they are good and bad will come. So uh, people will figure it out later or not. Right. So, right. Because computer scientists don't think about social implications. Yeah, you just yeah, think, hey, yeah. is this an interesting problem? OK, yeah. let's try and solve it. Let's, let's try and solve it, actually. <laughs> yeah. So that's crazy, actually. So people need to understand these things before they get into uh, get deeper into it. So thanks, I think <laughs> you have clarified more. Uh, but younger, younger composers, and uh, I mean, you said smaller composers, I won't use that term, but composers who are just starting their careers are mm -hmm. going to be in trouble because of artificial intelligence, because there is a way to make music, to make money as a composer, which is writing music for television, writing music for advertisement, writing music for even YouTube videos and writing stock music, the kind of stuff that goes mm -hmm. under reality shows and under, um, you know, under just sort of, daytime television that kind of thing mm -hmm. and that music is does not always require a high degree of skill and effort and that kind of music is the kind of music that ava is very very close to being able to make yeah, pretty exactly. consistently and even if they even if ava can't make it really really well it can make a lot of it really really fast and so um so that That's is definitely. that is something that i that i worry about and then the other side of that is that one of the you know the way you get paid for that kind of music mm -hmm. is in royalties and i don't know what the society is in india but there are royalty mm -hmm. societies in every country that collect money from broadcasters and then pay composers and that is a main revenue stream for some composers that's a, a primary revenue stream for some composers and if ava is able to produce ten thousand times as much music as anyone else that's going to dilute the pool um, and it's also going to mean that a, a technology company functionally is going to be sucking up a lot of those royalties. So not only is there the ability for computers to do that, there's also a market for it. And there's about a billion dollars of revenue annually that they could scrape up doing that if, you know, if they, if they were to corner the whole market. But I mean, if you had a startup and you said, I think we can quarter, you know, 15% of a billion dollar market with a team of 10 people and a couple million dollars of investment, you're probably going to get somewhere. Well, you know, the students uh, who are, who wants to, you know, start music by themselves, uh, if they are not different, if they are just, you know, average in simple terms. So mm -hmm. they may be facing the consequences if uh, if this big giants, if Ava or other companies like this start producing high number of, you know, fast uh, tracks and they can, you know, give it to them, as you're saying, right? If they're able to deliver the right track to the right person, then they will do, then they will do very well right now what's easier about dealing with me than dealing with Ava for something like that. I mean, I don't really do 
that type of music anyway. But if I did, the the difference would be I might take a little bit longer, but I'm going to give you one thing, which is what you need, rather than give you 50 options that you have to go through. Exactly. So now, if you're if you're a YouTube creator and you can't afford to hire me for you know several thousand dollars, maybe it is worth your time to spend an hour and go through those 50 options. But Mm -hmm. So for me, where I'm at, that's not a gig that I lost because I was never going to take that gig to begin with. But mm -hmm. for someone who's uh, starting out, you know, a couple hundred bucks for a YouTube video is, is a good job and you want to and you want to be able to do that. And so and if that if that revenue stream gets eaten up, then that person, instead of earning a few hundred dollars writing music, even if it's music for some random YouTube video, is going to have to earn that money doing something else, which means that the time that I was able to spend when I was their age writing music and getting good at my craft, they're having to spend doing something else to earn money, which means that the whole craft is going to go down over time. Exactly. That's, yeah. that's the voice I'm actually. But yeah. So, so how was your journey until now being in a TEDx talk and the plenty of things you have done? including the shepherd that was amazing actually i've seen that video and how you you know, you know trying to put out the shepherd uh, symphony and the uh, ai thing with ui actually so uh, would you like to give a glance about your journey uh sure i'm trying to find where did i put it oh here it is yep this is this is the this is the phone this is the huawei phone that i used oh, to, wow. to finish the symphony so i keep it in the studio um because it was my writing partner for uh for a few weeks so so that was pretty fun. Um, but uh, yeah. so Huawei, I have some friends who are computer scientists in the UK and mm -hmm. Huawei approached them with this idea and they quickly realized that they needed a human being to sort of make sense of the data and to translate it for an orchestra. And this is because uh, of, again, of narrative. You know, we have this myth that, you know, you think of Facebook and you think of Mark Zuckerberg. You don't think of the millions of man hours and hundreds of thousands of people that do and have worked for Facebook over the years, each one of whom is an important part of the development of that company. Um, but the way that we organize information in the 21st century in the, in the West is um, to attach it to, uh, to a personality. And so we, um, and this is a syndrome that I think is that we're all guilty of. And so I think when the, um, computer scientists even were thinking, oh, we'll use the, um, we'll use AI to finish Schubert's Unfinished Symphony. They didn't either realize or think that it was important that, you know, a composer might write a symphony, but then a copyist takes it and puts it on paper. And then um, a uh, concert master figures out the bowings and a conductor figures out some interpretation and someone has to rent a concert hall and uh, someone has to give them notes and someone has to know what to do when something isn't working. And there's all this human knowledge that is in theory quantifiable but in practice i think would just be too expensive to okay. to and and just requires too much detailed knowledge so the so what they realized was that well the computer might be able to write a symphony and, and even generate the sheet music it can't but if it could do that and just have it be sit in front of musicians then you know that would be that would be something but there's so much more that goes into it um and there's so much more details and there's so many more people and I am, you know, I or the conductor am the one that takes the bow at the end, and I'm the one whose name goes on the sheet music, but it really is and always has been a collaborative effort. And so that is just a, um, I think that is just a symptom, like thinking that this is possible is not necessarily a fallacy, but thinking about it being possible in the way that we think about it being possible is a fallacy. Um, that it was never one composer who wrote one piece of music that everybody just plays. Exactly. You know, it's always a group effort. And group so, effort. yeah. And so, so I think, so that's, so that's one thing that I learned from this whole experience, but so they realized this, they brought me in and that's why the piece is a collaboration between artificial intelligence and human intelligence, because what we were able to do was we finished, you know, I wrote two movements of a symphony in several weeks, which is really fast. Uh, we were able to get it on stage and um, give the audience, I think, a, a really fun and interesting evening. <laughs> and I think the, um, and so that was a, you know, but that was a really eye-opening experience for me because I, I started to realize all the technology that I use and all the assumptions that I have. And mm -hmm. I had to really evaluate my processes because I had to explain them to a machine. And I also right. had to explain them to a, a PR department so that we could figure out how to, you know, concisely say what I just took five minutes saying to you to a reporter <laughs> in a few sentences. Yeah. And, um, and so I really had to think about that. And and that's kind of, that's what led me to the TED talk was, you know, 
thinking about what it is that I do on a daily basis and how technology is just so integral to that process and how it is integrated in that process and how would I have been doing it 100 years ago or even 20 years ago and what are the implications for how music sounds that I am able to do it in this way that I'm able to do it and that's what led me to the uh, TEDx talk and um, that was a very strange experience because I had to deliver it to an empty auditorium because of COVID. <laughs> but um, other than that, it was really it was really fun, and it's a it's a it's a profound way to focus your ideas to get something some big idea into an eight minute talk. I think it was amazing. The TEDx I've heard all of it, and you really gave some good advice over there about the emotion <laughs> things and that, that. I think it was amazing. Thank you. So, Thank you. Yep. So, well, uh, would you like to play, uh, you know, it's a request from our audience in COVID. <laughs> Can mm -hmm. you play, as, you know, play something for us if you want? Yeah, I'm going to play you like something that has nothing to do with artificial intelligence. And uh, thank um, you for that. <laughs> I'm going to play you. Uh, this is a 1927 Vega professional plectrum banjo. It's oh. a four string banjo. You can see this beautiful heel carving. This is an ancient instrument from a time when the banjo was the most popular instrument in uh, the United States. Oh. And people who played banjos were um, rock stars. And this is not the kind of banjo that you play um, uh, bluegrass on. It's uh, the kind of banjo you play jazz on. And so I'm going to play you a little bit of an arrangement uh, by a guy named Eddie Peabody. And I'm going to do it the way that he did it. He was the most famous banjo player of the time. All right. And he lived uh, in California. All right. I can do the platform right now. I'm going to move myself okay. out. All right. So this is a plectrum banjo. It's tuned C, G, B, D, which is uh, different and unique um, among string instruments. I don't know any other string instrument that's tuned like that. For you, you musicians out there, that's a fifth, a third, and a minor third. So there's no two intervals that are the same on this instrument. Um, but Eddie Peabody was a great banjo player and a great technician, and I, I'm, I'm going to try to do this justice. So he would play a song. I'll just do this bit for you. So it's a song called Let Me Call You Sweetheart. And he would say, oh, you know, sometimes I like to play the banjo with a chord melody and I'll play like Let Me Call You Sweetheart, which was a popular song at the time. It goes like this. Yeah, so sorry, one more time. So that would be one part. One banjo would play that, and then another banjo would play. Right, and so that would be the backup part and the melody part. But Eddie Peabody said, well, why don't I play both of these parts at the same time? And that's what he did, is uh, this called the syncopated tremolo. That was uh, that was something for you. Nice man, and, uh, that was actually good. A little bit about the banjo. Um, I should just say for the audience that I was not aware that I was going to be asked to perform on this. Podcast. So, <laughs> I think it's know, fine. Studio, I got a bunch of instruments, so there we go. Uh, you always, uh, you know, walk out with it, so I think it's really good. Thank you for that. I think it was an amazing discussion we had and um, about the AI and the whole stuff, other stuff, and uh, I would really love if people just go check your website out and see a lot of work he have done and his name is Lucas Cantor and it's amazing the musics are amazing please check out even in the Spotify I guess you have all the musics right so I have a good amount of music on Spotify I just released an album called Delivery which is the soundtrack to a film and uh, I have another uh, piece of concert music that I did with AI called SoftBank Symphonia which was commissioned by SoftBank and I mm -hmm. uh, wrote that based on the location data based on the locations of their many companies that they invest in. They invest in hundreds of companies. So uh, you can listen to that. That was recorded with an octet here in Los Angeles. Amazing. Cool. So thanks, Lucas. Thanks for coming to the show and sharing your experience. And uh, I'm glad to have you around. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you, man.